How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the dark. Father, you are our hope. You, the unseen God, stepped into creation in the person of your Son, Emmanuel, God with us, whom we call Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Lord God, we worship, we lift our hearts in praise thanking you that this life is not the final chapter but there's life awaiting for those who are in Christ 
who have called upon the name of Jesus, the name above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Father God, this morning we pray that you would pour your spirit upon us and speak into our hearts and our lives. And Lord, you know the struggles that we carry, the ones that are here. Lord, would you do what only you can do, even as we sung, Lord, would you do what only you can do and move upon the needs and meet the needs. Speak peace into the storms, Lord, that, that are raging in some lives. Lord, bring healing to those that are suffering. Lord, for those that are suffering emotionally or in some way spiritually, Lord, bring deliverance, we pray. Lord, you are our living hope. Lord Jesus, you've risen from the dead. You've conquered death. And our hope is in you that one day we will see you face to face. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. What a blessed day. Amen. God is good all the time. It's a privilege to share the word of God with you this morning. It's a privilege to have our guests with us this morning. And, and uh, what, a, what an awesome reason to be here and, and uh, to see the, the new life that God has brought into the world. And, and uh, it's truly a miracle, isn't it? Children and life and babies and God is good. God is faithful. And just want to welcome you here and pray that God speaks into your life and, and that uh, this is a culmination of a great week with the Lord, that uh, your walk with God is not just about one hour or two hours a week, but that, but that it's daily, amen? Even as Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, indicates to me we need to be into the word and focused on the Lord daily, amen. Praise the Lord. I was excited to hear last week's testimonies from the camps. It's always a blessing, isn't it, to hear what God has done and to hear about a, a baptism so close to, to our church family in, in Hannah. And uh, we just rejoice with uh, the chapels and praise God. And if you miss that, you can catch it on YouTube. All right, the Lord's volunteers. I want to... Uh, as I was preparing this message, it kept getting longer and longer, and so I think I'm going to do part one today and part two next week, and so you won't get through all your notes, but save that and bring it back next week. The Lord's volunteers, I want to look at this passage in Romans 8, uh, verses 12 to 14. It says, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh. To live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That is amazing scripture. That is an amazing passage. For as many as are led by by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Those who are being led of the Spirit, the Word says. What does a Spirit-led life look like? We want, we want that, amen? Who are the sons of God? Those who are being led of the Spirit. What does a Spirit-led life look like? Well, one thing that we're given right in this passage, verse 13, if you have it, it's in front of you, but verse 13 says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What does a Spirit-led life look like? One of the first things is right here in this passage. It's a lifestyle of leading you away from sin. There's another scripture that says the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. That's Galatians 5. 
There's a real battle between our flesh and the spirit of God that lives within us. Amen. There's a real battle. And a spirit-led life is one that is leading you away from the things of the flesh or the body, the deeds of the body, as, as we read here in this passage. Or we would also read in some translations, the carnal man, the carnal nature. A spirit-led life is one that is a leading you away from sin, away from uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and one that follows the leading of the Spirit in the things of God. Think about that verse in 1 John that, that lists uh, the lust of the eyes, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the things that the Holy Spirit is leading God's children away from. You think about the lust of the flesh, that's the sensual, that's, that's, the, that's fulfilling the appetites of the flesh, kind of the sensual side of man. The lust of the eyes is, is, is our desire for things. It's easy to desire things, isn't it? In things, we have our security. In things, we, we have a sense of control. And the flesh desires to rest in those things. The flesh, the, the lust of the eyes desires to, to rest and to have our confidence in, in things uh, that we possess. Whether it's, a, it's a, a, an awesome retirement account or a house or security, whatever your situation may be. And the pride of life, the pride of life. When we love the praises of men, you can think about the Pharisees and and how they love the praises of man. What does a spirit-led life look like? It looks like a life that is being led away from these things. A, a lifestyle that is, that is just simply gratifying the desires of the flesh, or the desires of the eyes, or the pride of life. It is leading you away from those things. What does a spirit-led life look, look like? It looks like a life that God leads us into greater faith, into greater truth into a greater lifestyle that reflects the righteousness of God into his holiness. What does a spirit-led life look like? It looks like a life of spiritual growth that is taking you from one degree of God's grace to another. Amen? God's grace. What does a spirit-led life look like? What are some markers? Looks like the image of Jesus Christ. An image of loving people, even as Jesus loved people. Getting beyond the surface, getting beyond the baggage that people have, and loving the person. A greater love. A greater dependence upon Christ. In your Christian walk, I hope that you find that you are more and more depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Not less and less, but more and more. I remember uh, one dear sister in the Lord, as she came to faith said that she had two problems, and one of which was smoking, and, and she, that, that she believed the Lord was working on her on. But as the years passed by, she realized that God had a lot of other things that he was interested in working on also. Isn't, isn't that what you find in your Christian journey? That God is, is calling us to grow, yes, but also to depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is all my righteousness. It's not just a song, right? It's a reality. It's a reality. It's, it's almost like the analogy, the greater you get to a light, the lighter it is in the room, the more you see, the more junk you see on your own self, your clothes. The brighter the light, the more stuff you see. The closer we get to God, the, the more we grow in grace and knowledge, the more we realize that we do depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what a spirit-led life looks like. Not a dependence upon ourselves, but a dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is all my righteousness. The word says we love him because he first loved us. Unpacking that love is part of that spirit-led life of realizing that God loves me even though I have dirt on my clothes or problems. To, to be led of the spirit stands in contrast to being led of one's own spirit. You know, I can't tell you how many times, enough times, 
when there's been a catastrophic moral failure in someone's life, how I've heard them say the words, you know, I just need this. Maybe you've heard that too. You know, this, I just need to do this for me. And yet what we see here in the scripture is not about you. It's not about what you're wanting, but it's about where the spirit is leading. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in the context of a breakdown, of a major breakdown, is that, you know, I just need this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. The word here is led. And if you think about the word led, you realize that it has some very serious uh, ramifications to it, consequences to it. When you think of the word led, if I am led, then I've chosen to be led. If I am led, then there is a willingness in my soul. There's a choice. There's a willingness. To be led, one must follow. And again, to be led, one must choose to be led. I love this word led. As many as are led of the Spirit, these are the sons of God. As many as who are willing, who have chosen. There's a difference between being led and being forced. <clears throat> a leader a leader can lead his team by talking about vision can uh, lead by encouraging people to buy into the vision. They do by, that by laying out a common goal, a common purpose. When a leader leads in that manner of laying out the vision, a common goal, a common purpose, a mutual end, people get excited about that and they're willing to invest. Or the opposite side of that is a leader that can say, just do it. And not talk about vision, not talk about common purpose. That when they're asked why, uh, they, their response is, just do it, right? You don't need a reason why. Those two are quite different, aren't they? They stand in... Contrast and opposition and philosophy. Philosophically, they stand opposite one another. And yet here God is saying, who are the sons of God? Those who are being led. Picture a shepherd with the sheep following behind, which we've often seen that picture, I'm sure. The sheep are being led. There's a connection with the shepherd, right? The sheep understand that the shepherd provides, that the shepherd protects, that the shepherd cares for the sheep, and they willingly follow. Contrast it with a cattle drive. And we thought sheep were stupid, right? It's the cattle. We, were, we had it wrong. The cattle are driven. There's no will involved. It's just a matter of, of uh, getting the dogs on the right side, the horses on the right side. The, the cows are not connected. They're not aware. They're not following. They're just being driven. God could drag us somewhere, couldn't he? And maybe he has drug you somewhere. God could force us. And again, sometimes he will if he has to. I think of 
the example in the scriptures of unconverted Saul, who became Paul, whom God greatly used. God had a way of getting a hold of, 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 of forcing Saul's attention, didn't he? As on his way to persecute God's people, the Lord knocked him off. The donkey blinded him. That's the rough way of, of God getting your attention, isn't it? And again, it's probably part of all of our journeys in one way or the other. Of God dealing with us more directly. But God desires something better for us as his children. Who are the sons of God? Those who are being led of the Spirit. God desires something so much better for us. God forcing people and pushing them in a certain direction is not what's being said here. What is being said is that the sons of God are led of the Spirit. I hope this challenges you. It challenges me. It gets me to think. Is, my, is your Christian walk, is your Christian life more about what you have to do or what you volunteered to do? To be led is to have volunteered. Is it about ritual or is it about relationship? Is it about being forced? And you know, we can be forced to do many things in our lives, right? By tradition. We can, we can do, I have to do that. By tradition. Maybe by pride, maybe by family pressure. But the question is, is what you're doing, is it more about being forced or is it more about a natural overflow within you because of the Holy Spirit at work within you. If this verse tells us anything, it is that true Christianity is a matter of the heart. Of the heart. The relationship with God is a willing choice to follow, to be led of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Think about it this way, as you, as you think about the scripture, in volunteering to serve the Lord, think about it this way. The sons of God are not being forced to seek the face of God day to day, week to week. Rather, they are willingly being led to do that. The sons of God are not being forced to seek the will of God through prayer and study and counsel, but they are being willingly led of the Spirit. Sons are led of the Spirit. They willingly engage. They have volunteered. Again, I, I want to emphasize this difference between being led and being forced. And again, force can come in many different uh, forms. Tradition, pride, family, But there's a difference. One brings life, the other takes it. I think about that, that generation that came out of Egypt and, and they had a leader, Moses. But they weren't willingly being led, were they? We remember things that they said as they came out of Egypt. They had that slave mentality, that first generation. They had a mentality of slavery, of being forced. Remember, remember the things, some of the things that they said. Moses, why did you bring us out here? What are you, what are you doing? Remember one thing that they asked is, Moses, were, did you bring us out here because there weren't any graves in Egypt? And remember one thing that we can identify, where's the meat? The old Wendy's commercial, where's the beef? They want to know where the beef was. 
and they would say, we ate good back in Egypt. They asked, we're something to drink. Have you brought us out into this desert to, to kill us with thirst? That a leader, but they weren't following. But they stood in contrast to the next generation who also had a leader, but this time they were being led of Joshua. They were willingly following the Lord's call. They had faith that God was bringing them into the promised land. Again, the children, the sons of God are being led of the Spirit. What a contrast to being forced. I remember the difference between my educational experience in high school and, and college. You see, in high school, I was, I was put into school when I was in kindergarten, and I had 13 years, 12 and a half years of being in a place that I was told, you're going and I didn't have a very good attitude. Some of you can test, testify to that. But there was a difference between coming out of high school a place and, and school, a place where that's just what you did starting about age five. That's, that's where you were. And oftentimes you found yourself surrounded by people who had the same attitude. And you weren't investing. You were mandated. You were forced to be there and versus college, Right? In college, everything changed because my attitude was different. My perspective was different. I wanted to learn. I enjoyed learning. There was a goal. There was a purpose behind what I was doing. I could see that goal. I'm going to get a degree, and it's going to position me to get a job, and I'm going to be able to buy a car. Everything changed with the attitude, with the perspective. One was forced one was led. Here we read that the sons of God are those that are led of the Spirit. To have the Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit, is to see the Lord's goodness. To have the Spirit is to see the Lord's glory. To have the Spirit is to experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It is to have a hope within you that drives you, a fire within you that, that compels you to be led, to follow, to seek God, to desire to know his will and do it God's way. The abundant Christian life is not found in I have to, but rather I choose to. I volunteered. I have volunteered. I want this. Of course, the, the reality of it is, is that your flesh, that body of sin that the Bible talks about, the carnal nature, the, that's going to struggle that's going to struggle, but that's, that's nothing to worry about. That's normal. These, these bodies have yet to be redeemed. There's a new man, there's a new spiritual man within me through the birth in, in, into Christ. But this old house of clay remains. Even as Paul wrote, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Your flesh is going to struggle with it, but the, the inner man, the spiritual man, the man that is in communion with God through his spirit is desiring something greater, is pursuing God, is following the lead of the spirit. It is not your Christian life. It will not be one of drudgery or being forced or mere duty, but it will be of the heart, out of love, because he first loved us. There will be a hunger within you. Give me this word, God. Show me your ways, your truth, your plan. Yeah, your flesh is going to struggle with it. That's okay. That's normal. But here we're called to overcome that through the Spirit. 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So let me close by challenging you to remember that you are a volunteer. You have, by this grace and the Spirit of God, you have raised your hand and you have said, Lord, sign me up. I want you. I desire you. My, my time in the Word, my time in prayer, my time in service, my contribution to the church, whatever that is, is because I desire within the spiritual man to be part of that because that's the work that you're doing in this earth. Don't get trapped in the wrong mindset. Walk in all the fullness of God. Walk as a son of the living God. Remember what you have chosen, the Lord, and to follow him and his ways. And remember who has chosen you, amen? amen. Who has chosen you? I'm willing are you willing? I'm willing, Lord. There's a spiritual man within me, the new man, the man of faith, the man born again of your spirit that is desiring you, that is hungering for you. And I want that, and I choose that. Amen. We'll close there. Worship team, would you come? Let's stand together.
Let's pray. Father God, you who search the hearts, search our hearts, Lord. Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, the spirit of promise, the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father the spirit of truth, the spirit of power, the spirit of love. Lord, search our hearts. And remind us, Lord, this morning that, Lord, yes, you've chosen us, but we've chosen you. You have shown us your goodness. You have shown us your glory. You've shown us that your ways are ways of life health, victory, peace, joy, righteousness. Lord, you've shown us your glory and your goodness. Lord, help us to remember that at the deepest part, at the core of our being, at the core of this new man in Christ, is a man who cries out for more of you. Lord, let us not get sidetracked or deceived by the lies of the enemy. Lord, show us who we are in Christ your beloved children, your sons, your daughters that are led of your spirit. Lord, that you haven't somehow captured us and have forced us, but Lord, you have said, you've invited us and you've shown us your glory. And Lord, that the Christian life, the Christian walk is about an incredible experience of knowing you, of learning more of you, of growing in grace and knowledge, of depending upon your son, Lord, that the Christian life is just that. It's life. Lord, lead us. Fill us with your spirit. Strengthen us. Search our hearts, God. Search our hearts. Lord, we love you today. We praise you. We give you all the honor and all the glory for everything that's being done in our lives, in our families, in our loved ones in our communities, everything that's being done good, Lord, we give you the glory. Lord, lead us, strengthen us now. Show us a little greater glimpse of your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.